I just want to do this because I just felt like sometimes we come to conferences and we live with certain things hanging. We lived with certain things in our hearts. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask questions because um, if you're a great student, you ask questions. Amen? Absolutely. So that's, that's what I want to encourage. I want to encourage dialogue. You know, sometimes, yeah, people can just, you know, preach to you, but sometimes it's good for you to ask questions. Like we were talking about, like Pastor Demola James was saying that when you ask, when you ask for help, it doesn't mean that you are weak. It means that you need help, and that will strengthen you as a man. And that is the purpose why we are gathered here. So if anybody has got a question, you know, you can raise your hand, and then just just ask any question. But I, I'm I'm, I'm going to ask the first question, amen. <laughs> so I can encourage you to to come up, come up with some questions. There was something that was said today from beginning of the, this conference. And people talk about, like, I think both of you talked about maturity. I wanted to ask, uh, we'll start with you, Reverend T Tony Copeland. Tell us. I wasn't here. You were not here, but. <laughs> <we're> <laughs> so I was going to ask, um, can you tell us how you have matured in God? How have you matured in God? And how can you encourage another man to mature and grow in God? It's a big question. Now, um, I wasn't um, saved or being preached to by um, uh, anybody. I was reading the book, um, uh, the Bible from um, King James Bible, and I got to Job. Now, this time we was in Central America, and um, I'm a reggae DJ and an entertainer. <laughs> and, uh, so you got, you got everything, I'm, I'm, and you're on the radio station, you're on all sorts going on. But what got me is, and we talk about this uh, you know, maturity coming, yeah? What got me is, um, is Job's, and this is, this, this is absolutely, this is, I think this is the right uh, part to do, yeah. That Job, he had a relationship with God, and by his, his actions, his behavior, you can tell his maturity. How mature, in other words, his position with God, how he knew God, and that there was no other way. Whether you kill me or you don't kill me or whatever, you are God and you're God alone. So for me, it was, the, it was on the scripture, got saved by Jesus, stopping me in the jungle, you know, where we was and stuff like that. That's how I got saved, but time. Um, I want to use David as an example. Um, before he was anointed, he was in the wilderness. So he had said things when he came on the scene, the God who delivered me from the bear, from the lion, will deliver me from you. So those were his stages. There were things that he went through that helped him in his process, as Pastor Demola James said, so that when it was now time for him to walk in what he was doing, he was able to. On the flip side, we see whereby in the place of sexual sin, unfortunately, David wasn't able to rein that in. So that's a lesson for all of us. There are two sides. Though he was an anointed man of God after God's own heart, there was a part of his life whereby, as an example, wasn't sorted out. So for me personally, there are things that, by the grace of God, I've allowed God to process out of me that I'm no longer doing. But at the age that I am today, there's still things that God is shining a light on saying, sort out, sort out. Because unlike Moses, if you don't sort it out, come when you're plus 80, the children of Israel will do something, you will still show anger at such a great age. So those are things, learn those lessons, don't skip. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how I um, was able to get to a place of maturity is what um, Pastor here said, that um, like Christ learned obedience by the things he suffered. And in that, in that thing, the chast chastisement of God, how God chastises you, you can only, you've got to learn the easy way or the hard way. <laughs> that God, because God's got a calling upon your life, because God loves you, because you've made a covenant with God, and God is faithful to keep the covenant, the chastisement of God comes upon you, and it's up to you how long it takes before you learn the obedience. Then when you learn the obedience, you can grow and then mature. And then when you get catch that, then next time the chastisement comes, you're going to be quick to obey because you remember the last time and it, it, it hurts, <laughs> but it's, it's necessary. So that's the way I, I was able to grow up and become mature. Hallelujah. 
Well, for me as a person, I think my wilderness experience is where I got more matured. Like I said earlier, we received Christ July 10, 1996. But pilot at that time, I was matured in Christ. But as soon as I came to UK, it's a very total different ball game entirely. But because God knew what he was doing, you know, he had to take me through that wilderness. Because prior to that time, I'm almost drawing back from God. And when God allowed that situation to happen, for that 10 years, now became a time that God had to really mature me. The pains I went through, you know, they really deep pains. And what pains do to you is that pain bring good in you. And when you go, you change. You know, so this is what happened to me. You know, I also want to mention this that maturity also requires mentorship. There are two ways you learn in life, either through mentorship or through your mistakes. Thank you. So sir. as Christian, our maturity call also that who is mentoring us mm. very important. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Anybody with any yeah. Coming up what um, Pastor was saying, this is very important that we don't miss this. And it will talk about through the wilderness. Now, anytime you, you have a product, you've got to test it. It's very important. If um, Mercedes made a car, or so many cars, and something wrong with one of them, they call them all back. And just like David, God had to test the product. You see, David didn't know that God was testing him. And that's why he failed. And now, when God came back to him and said, thou art the man, then it looks at you know, to see whether you really want to change. And it's, it's vital. And that's maturity. The ability to change. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone with any question? Anything that's on your heart that you'd want to ask? Anybody? Don't be shy. Anybody? <laughs> I know someone's on, got a question. Come on, man of God. Anybody with a burning question, like something that you really want to know? How can I work this out? Remember, we are here to help each other. We are here to, you know, receive something from one another. Amen. Iron sharpens iron. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to be forged? <laughs> That should be the question. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. So no, no question, right? So, okay, I'm gonna qu ask a, another question. Is like through your your growth with Christ, what was there any point in your walk with God where you struggled with sin so badly in your life? And if you did, how did you manage to come out of it? The scene might be addiction, might be pornography, might be masturbation, might be just not being unfaithful to God and to your spouse, whatever. How did you manage to come out of that? And are you free from it? Let me go first. Um, this one's not live, but we're recording, right? We're recording, yes? Okay, but we're recording, good. Right, so, because um, <clears throat> it's vital that people will see this, and um, I've shared some of this before. So. As a, as a teenager, most teenagers explore with masturbation or sexual sin. So there was sexual sin in the case of imagery and watching porn and things like that. But I never actually masturbated until I was in my 20s. So when I got into my 20s, I thought to myself, oh, it's only... The, the ladies, can you leave us for a minute? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs> she, she wasn't here when I dismissed the other one. So. No worries. So for me, and especially the young man at the back, if you can hear me out, when I was young, I thought it's only something that happens to young people. So I was now in my 20s and never did, never explored with it whilst I was a teenager or young. Obviously a single man, wasn't in a relationship or anything. So it wasn't that, oh, I was in a relationship. I knew, I was a Christian then, knew that I couldn't do this. And okay, this would be my way. I just let it slip from going back to watching porn again after watching it very, very briefly as a teenager, but not carrying on because I only did it, my friends did. So I said, well, I'm not going to stop doing that. So I only watched it with my friends. And now found myself at a place whereby I wasn't 
accountable to anyone, even though I was in a church community, but I wasn't accountable to anyone. There was no one that could pull pull me up or on the outside of serving God and everything. People didn't know what was going on on the inside. Interestingly enough, there was actually one day, and this is when it taught me that <laughs> God is a different type of God. There was one day I'd actually masturbated, and in the morning I woke up with a song for the Lord is worthy to be praised. In praising him, we have our victory. Back then, I didn't actually know it was something that God was saying to me, that, look, I want to deal with this. And it was when I now got to somewhere, I was actually going to minister somewhere that day. Before ministry, I realized, oh, hold on a second, God wants to deliver me. So it was after that and praying, Still didn't share with anyone and confess it, which we should do to confess our sins. But it was after that that I was now able to be delivered. But let me tell you the truth. That was 2000 and either eight or nine. I can't remember eight or nine. Four years later in 2011 or three years later, had another period. Same thing again. So, um on accountability, not telling someone about it, and went through about three, four months of doing that again, and not telling anyone. The story's not over. 2013, this time around, I didn't do it for a period of time, I did it once, and I said, you know what, I'm not gonna let this happen again, I need to tell somebody. So the moment I told someone, and put that out in the open, since 2013, this 2019, I've not been back there. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. I thank my brother for, for his honesty. Now, believe, him, believe you me, you know the armed forces. The army, the first day I went to the armed forces, they had, um, you know, these striptease. Women comes in, and this was, believe you me, I, I was completely sh shocked. Women comes, and they strip off, and... Um, they, you know, they do everything. And they'll, they'll come to you for you to want to play with them. Now, I don't know whether it's a Jamaican thing. I will say, well, look, if them guys play with you, I don't want to, want to touch you. Because me don't want them kind of something. So, you understand what I mean? But the masturbation thing, it's common. It is common, is what I mean. And to try and get out of it, you see what I mean? It takes God. No wonder God had to save me in the jungle. I got saved by Jesus in the jungle. You, you see what I mean? And it's also um, a, a mindset as well. Because, <clears throat> because the thing is, the other thing, if you, like you say, if you've got nobody um, to help you, nobody with you, you will struggle. You understand what I mean? And you'll be, you, you know, we, you'll be doing this um, on your own. We do, we do a lot of um, research and a lot of studies about you know about humanity, the human mind, you know the body, and um, and why I'm saying this because you asked me about maturity, and that's why I had to go through all these universities to to try and get to the bottom of actually who are we, and how am I supposed to work with my body, my mind, and everything? What am I supposed to do? You see what I mean? Because you see, huh, this is the problem: the past are doing it. You see what's going on. I'm not saying that's an, an excuse, but it don't help me, does it? You understand me? So you need somebody who's been there. That's what I said about Job. The relationship Job had with God, it doesn't matter what comes, he's standing firm. You understand me? And, you know, and like my brother say, that sometimes it is difficult. But what I said to men today, yeah? Find a wife. <laughs> Find a wife, a good woman, Proverbs 30 or 31, Proverbs 30, 31, yeah. Find a good woman who can help you with your work. That's the woman you watch. You understand me? Make sense? We, we know, we, we need this kind of, um, uh, this is good mm -hmm. that we as men to um, help one another. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know if somebody could be doing it mm -hmm. and they, you know, they, they want to hear something, you see what I mean? So this is to help us. Because remember, it is common in the armed forces. In the armed forces, if if you don't do it, they laugh at you. <laughs> I'm telling you, 
Because when you know when I first got in the armed forces, so we Jamaica, we don't do them kind of. They said nastiness, but they, they, you know what they said? No, they said no. It's to prove that you're a man. Mm. The arm, I'm telling you, it's it's crazy. But coming out Fair of well. the armed force, you can understand why why it's like that, because they don't want to be funny men, and we and and, and, and trouble. We I you know I personally we used to beat them up. You know, I know that was wrong. We used to beat them up, but you know. But like I say, you're, you know, you're, you're mature now, and it's the ability now to, to help them to, to come out of those things. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yourself. I don't know if this mic works, does it? Yeah, yeah it's just about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's his voice. <laughs> I know, he's got a big voice. Uh, no, I did, I did, I did a, si a series a while back about um, um, process going through a process so pro process of deliverance process of healing process of refinement and a lot of the times what people try to do is they try to tackle everything at the same time and it doesn't work but a lot of things to do with sin is tied to something else and when when, when if you think of seeds in a, a soil that as you're digging through it that you might have to get rid of some other stuff before you can get to the other stuff and you have to kind of dig your way through it. So it's about sitting down with the Holy Spirit and obviously being honest and saying, right, I've got these issues. This is where I fall short. This is where I mess up. This is where I commit sin in my life. And instead of trying to tackle all of them at the same time, becoming frustrated, just allow the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, what do I deal with first? And then when, when the Lord shows you what to deal with first, what's that tied to? Well, this is tied to that. So if I get rid of that, now I can get rid of that. Because if we try to get rid of some stuff without getting rid of the other stuff, is this making sense what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, but I'm just making sure I you... was going to ask a question. Yeah. So giving that advice to somebody who doesn't actually even have that relationship or intimacy with the Holy Spirit, okay. how would that person cope when the Holy Spirit is not telling them anything? Uh, it's, ex it's, it's, it's to the point where you come to what they said about accountability. Right. We're looking to men of God that have walked, that have left footprints for us to walk in. So like a gathering like this where you listen to men of God that have gone through stuff or in your own church and you can go to them and say, and step one is come into the light, expose it, shame the devil. Because unless you do that, you never have freedom, never have deliverance, never have healing. And so you come into the light and share it and expose, shame the devil. Then is your point of deliverance. And from there, you can get to where God has called you to be. That's, that's good. That's good. Pastor Dumola. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Here's a mic. Here's a mic. You, you don't need no mic. Your voice is so loud, man. Hallelujah. Amen. I think for me... Um, it's got nothing to do with sexual sin, but more or less probably advanced level. Let me use that. A part of my story, like I was sharing earlier, was uh, my visa ran out when I first came to UK. And you know, because I don't want to go back to Nigeria, obviously. But um, despite being a Christian, in fact, an usher in the church, I had to go to the black market. For those of you that know what they call black market in the UK, which means that I have to get a fake document to work. Uh, you know. So, and I became an, an assistant manager in three mobile shop. And in 2009, I was caught. You know. But you know something is that, even though I'm a Christian, spirit fed, I know I was living in sin. I know it's not something that I actually bring glory to God. But back in your mind, you want to survive. And you don't want to go back home. Home office are saying, go back home. You don't want to go. So you just want to stay. You know. And eventually I was caught and I was sent to the prison. And I spent four months in the prison. And I remember that year, six days before that, I was sent to the prison. It was my birthday. My first night, my first three nights in the prison was God appearing to me. You know, eyes. And that was my turning point. You know, uh, maybe that's what, what actually kept me for 10 years. Because I spent four months and the judge looked at me and so I said, okay, I'm going to release you. You know, so, so, so I think my court case was postponed like four or five times. They just keep on postponing it. Keep on postponing it. The, the very first day I appeared in court and the judge was, about, the guy was about 80 plus years. When he did his judgment, Obviously, you will spend half of his sentence. I think I was given five months. So then I had to do two and a half. 
that very day was the day the sentence finished. And so, you know, eventually Murphy said that they will not release me. Then uh, we've and I had to apply again, using that opportunity to apply. So the home office now kept me for another two, three weeks before they now released me. Now, when I got back home, I just sat down and said, Lord, I surrender all. I don't know when this home office is going to make the decision. I was thinking probably one year or two years. Never knew it's going to be a 10 years journey. I never knew. So, that was my turning point. To just say no. But through that 10 years, I can tell you, advices came. I know pastors that advise me that can't sit down at home. I need to go and look for something. I said, me? No. Why? Because in my life, I never believed I'm going to be in the prison. In my life. In my life. I couldn't imagine it. But... I knew God had a purpose for it. He had the purpose why he had to take me into that prison for those short period of time between September and December 18. He had the reason for it. And when I came out, I added on to that why. And that was what carried me for that thing, yes. There were temptations along the line. There were different advices. There were different Different things, even from men of God, spirit feed. So that's why the Bible says, which report shall we believe? Who is speaking into you? So, and I was able to make myself accountable to people. Genuine ones. People that I know that they have value. They stand for something. He's talking about accountability. But I subjected myself, apart from God, I submitted to people that they mentor me. I was accountable. They check on me to make sure that, you know, and to God be the glory after 10 years, the Lord did it. You know, so we need to understand that whatever thing we are struggling with now, God is aware. He knows about it. But he wants us to be honest with him. You know, you can't hide from God. He created you. He wants you to be honest. I remember a prayer I, pray, I prayed years ago, before that incident, I said to God, Lord, I, want, I don't want to use this document to work anymore. But then there's no other way. You don't know. But when it happened, that gave me an opportunity to put in a fresh application. Amen. So, praise God. Praise God. Uh, oh, can, can, I, can I ask the people, because we've gone over time, are you guys okay? If we have five more minutes? Is that okay? You know, we need their permission. Amen. We don't okay. want to violate their time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's a very, very important um, thing here what our brother was saying here. Is that... Um, it's about testing, testing and accountability. Because if if God puts you into a position of trust, you know, accountability, and you now have your plan, you sort of mean you you know you see that um, well, this doesn't it looks favourable if I do this, well nobody's going to know, but everybody's doing it. You, you sort of mean, yeah. but it's it's a testing because when 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 David looks over the balcony and um, he, saw, <laughs> he saw the woman. In his mind, this is the woman that he wants and he don't care about anybody else. Whoever this woman belongs to, that guy is going to die in the, heat of the, in the heat of the war. It's what I mean. So it's about testing. And, and your, I think it's about habits. You see what I mean? Your desire. It's, um, it's sex and money. You see what I mean? And, and, that, and, and that's what it is. The, the devil did that with Jesus, Matthew 4, about, you know, you know testing. And, if, and like I was saying, that if, you, if you haven't got um, a mentor to, to help you, you, you know what I mean? You, you're going to do the, the very exact thing. And the devil's after the mail, you know that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone with a question? This is my last question. Oh. Hey, yeah, yeah. we just get like uh, we've heard details bits and bobs can we just get like a, a snapshot of your te testimony like your personal salvation story you know, Jesus Christ power in your life is that, is that okay I, I know that's going to be a short yeah. oh, yeah. Pastor Luke how, how are you going to do this because with our time we've got left 
that that thing needs one, to time one, us. One minute, one minute. One minute. Everyone, one minute. So I, I grew up in a Christian home, um, thanks be to God. And it was when I was, um, it was when my dad left at the age of 12, because I had, as a child, felt his love, but was very, very fearful of his chastisement. So him leaving, he was like, ah, oh, I'm free now. So I began to explore a lot of things. But God kept me in my exploring and disobedience of my mom. So that from that age of 12, it set the course for walking away from God. When I got to the, to the time of university, um, things were just all over the place. But before going to university, I actually had a football injury, uh, tore my ACL. So my first year of uni, I didn't play any football, still going about clubbing and all those things. But I had a surgery in the summer of my first year, after my first year. So that kind of <coughs> put me back. In my first year, I would try to sleep with any, any woman I could, and I couldn't. And every time I tried it, I still couldn't sleep with someone. And that's when I knew that, you know what? If these women claim they like me, and I'm not getting, as they said, to second base, something must be up. In my third year, God saved my life, and that's how it happened for me. Praise Jesus. Thank you, sir. Uh, amen. <clears throat> I think uh, me and Pastor Luke was probably the same, same kind of thing. I was brought up with my, my grandparents in Jamaica, and uh, I was born here, um, and after five months, I was sent to Jamaica, and, you know, going to church and everything. And then come back, coming back to UK, my father's in, in Freemason, and um, he was making sure he's getting rid of every single thing about Jesus out of me. And, uh, you know, as a child, you know, it's, it's your father. And, he, and you know what Jamaicans' uh, fathers are like? You know, they don't, they don't, they don't play. <laughs> That's what I mean. But me, um, you probably call me stubborn in that sense, because if, I'm, if I want to go somewhere, just like my grandparents taught me, don't ever beg anybody for anything. You see what I mean? Wherever you want to go, you, you do your best to get there. So I had his, um, his, his maths books, his physics books and everything. By the age of 13, I repaired a transistor radio. By the age of 14, I made a transistor radio. So I was doing all these things. But he was um, so, um, we talk about angry. Um, my other brothers, you know, you know, they was brought up with him and, you know, spent money on them and everything. And these guys weren't, these guys didn't have what I had. And, I, and this is what, when God gives you something, you sort of mean, what did he say? Nobody can take it from me. You sort of mean. So that was, that was, that was the problem with, with, with myself and my father. It was, it was, um, it was a worse that, you know, you, you as a child uh, in a condition to grow up in. Um, by 15, I, I, um, I was out on the streets. I didn't do nothing wrong. I was on the streets. Didn't do nothing wrong at all. And it was an Irish couple who, who took me in. For me then, thinking about Christianity, can, can you imagine? This guy claims to be a Christian and he's, a, he's in Freemason and all kind of thing. What would you think I'll be thinking? You, you see what I mean? So, and that's why God had to have me in the armed forces so he can save me. You understand me? And then that, you know, um, the rest is, I mean, there's, there's a, you know, I could go through a whole heap of stuff. You see what I mean? I've seen the come up against the occult and, and, you know, all kind of thing. And it was when they say, I can't trouble you. And they just couldn't do anything. And it's when God speak to me, that's him that called me. So anywhere, any devil, any occult, whatever it is, they will come and they will look at you. And they just can't trouble you. So for me then is to study. I want you to know God. I want you to know the scripture. I end up in one of the, you know, the best universities, Oxford and all other places and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Because I just wanted to, uh, wanted to know. Because if these guys, my father, was, he, was a, you know, he, he designed things for um, Saudi Arabia and you know, the electronic stuff and whatever. And if this guy claims to be a Christian, when did he know God? You see what I mean? And is, is God real? Can you see the problem? Because if you're, you're as a father, and God is a father, and if your father can't behave like God, then is God real? You see what I mean? So God had to separate me away from my family, my parents, 
and taught me the way he wants to talk me. That's why when I got to Job, that's how I got saved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my, my past and my childhood um, was quite... Uh, I mean, it was good up until the age of 14. And then from... And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was going up until the age of 14 uh, and then something happened that dramatically changed my life. Um, someone that pretended to be a friend of my father's, um, I'd gone to the pub where my dad used to drink and uh, being there to be close to my dad, but he wasn't there at the time. So I was playing pool and whatnot and um, waiting for my friends to come play pool and um, this man that claimed to be a friend of my father's basically said oh do you want some alcohol and me being jack the lad at 14 yeah yeah yeah, i'll take some alcohol and to the point where i was playing pool with him and uh cut a long story short he basically groomed me and took me home and abused me and sexually abused me and, and at that age it messed me right up I mean, it got me to the point where I'd rebel against my parents because I didn't know how to handle it. I'd mess up in school and not go to school. And because I'd, I'd distanced myself away from my family and my dad, who, who should have been my role model, I looked to the elder, lad, the, elder, the elder men or the elder lads to sort of like, for that affirmation or to someone to hang around with. So as you can imagine, then it started on drugs, taking drugs, using drugs, going to the clubs, sleeping around, doing all that madness. Um, but it wasn't until I was 19 after serving a few jail sentences, being in and out of psychiatric wards, messed up to the point where I'd burnt every bridge with my family, burnt every bridge with getting a place to live, so I was homeless on the streets. And at the age of 19, like I said earlier up here when I was ministering, that I'd made up my mind. I got to that place where I said, I'm going to take my life. It's not worth living anymore. I've broken the hearts of my family. They don't want to know me anymore. Um, this life is not for me anymore. You know, it's nothing to live for. But on my way to commit suicide, a thought came into my mind and said, if you take your life, will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? And that thought pricked my conscience. And as I thought about heaven and hell, I had this anger against God because I'd heard about Jesus. I heard Jesus can change your life. Jesus can save your life. But I didn't know God. I didn't know Jesus. And so I stormed into Manchester Cathedral in Manchester and I just had it out with God. And I didn't know how to pray. I just said, God, if you're real, you need to come right now. I don't believe in you. I don't believe in Jesus. But if you're real, you need to come right now. And I fell to my knees and I cried my heart out. And I spent a good 20 minutes just pouring every tear that could possibly be shed. And, I, and I, I stayed there on my knees and all of a sudden this, this silence came, that like peace like I've never known before. And a voice spoke and said, yes, I am your God and you are my child. Now go and it shall be done. And I got up from that place, I opened the doors and there were, in front of me was two evangelists. And <laughs> I knew God, God had drawn me to him. There's something about him, there's a glow and a warmth. And I just walked up to him, I said, you don't know me. I said, my name's Gary. I said, I was going to take my life today, but I believe there might be some help. And they looked at me and smiled because God had spoken to them that morning and said, you need to be here at this time. And that's where my journey began. You know, they, they prayed for me there and then. They said, do you want to ask Jesus into your life? I asked him into my life. And that was my journey from the age of 19. And here I am at 37. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Pastor Timola, one minute. Okay. Um, I came from the family. Mike, thank you. Hallelujah. I came from a family of eight children. I have three sisters before me, three sisters after me, then a boy. Uh, it's a monogamous home till 1998-89. My father married another wife. And that was the beginning of my journey in terms of I was bitter against my dad because the love he had for me, he has transferred the love to someone else. So I don't have that kind of relationship with him anymore. I don't talk to him in the house. You know, we just bought, as God we have it, my mom's second daughter, which is our second born, she gave her life to Christ probably around 1990. And she sort of be the light in the house. Um, for those of us that came from a polygamous home, it's a tough, it's a dark place because everybody are trying to Probably, you know what they call charm or juju, you know, to each other, you know. But my mom is a very, very strong Christian to tomorrow. You know, she's very solid. She's a very praying, praying woman. And so, between 1990 and 1996, 1995, 1996, throughout my secondary school, 
I wasn't, I didn't have that sort of relationship with my dad. And along the line, I started moving with one crowd in my community, you know. And my sister felt like what I needed was Jesus, not even my father. And the scripture she gave to me then was that God said he would be a father to the fatherless. And that was the turning point. Even though my father is still alive, but that fatherly love, that fatherly relationship wasn't there. Because obviously his focus has changed to the other woman and her children. And so even though we live, we all live in the same house, you know, but then there's something else, there's a shift in self, you know. And I started misbehaving, became rebellious, stubborn, you know, I could destroy my dad's car because I was really bitter against him for going through that route. You know, so I um, started looking at me one day and then something happened between my dad and myself that was really, really dangerous. And my sister felt like, wow, the way this boy is going is going to lead him. So he, she sort of talked. I think she preached to me for almost about four, five, six times. I just said to her, I leave Jesus. And after all, we go to church. We, you know, we go to church and until one day, that was July 10, 1996, I sort of cried and you know, we leave, we see, then I was already in campus. I was already in uni. And I received Christ into my life. Uh, when I got back to uni my second semester, a lot of people noticed the change while I was in uni. Because my first semester, I almost wanted to join the court in the campus. Almost. Only two steps for me. And the, the, first, the, other, the, the, the first step was for me to say yes. And the second step for them to initiate me into it. And we had a strike. So they sent everyone home. It was when I went back home, the Lord did the miracle. So when I came back to the campus, I came back as a different person. So I became quiet in the class. I just, uh, sometimes I would just look. And the Christian sisters in the class knew something has happened to this guy. And they came to me and said, they know what has happened. You know, would I love to be part of There's something we call the 12th in the class. And I joined them. So, and that was the my turning point. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Hope you guys got something. Amen. Um, yeah, we've gone over time, and I think people are hungry. Amen. So we just. <laughs> you can catch up during dinner. <laughs> well, you know, people want to go. So, yeah, you know what? We just want to thank God. Thank God for what He has done. Amen. Uh, what what we just gonna do now? I just I just want us to stand. Uh, let's let's all stand. I, I just feel like we we need to we need to pray for one another.